Hi friends, welcome back again to Quiet Time. I hope you're cozy and ready to read. We're going to read chapter 7. Let's take a peek at how long this chapter is. Okay, it's about as long as the last one, about 10 pages. Okay, chapter 7 on page 55. Surprise attack. That night, after dark, the being from outer space returned to clean room 26. As nervous as I was about Aldo's disappearance, I was glad that she'd said she couldn't operate on anyone for a while. She wasn't going to take off for the planet Sperling until summer, so I had a little time to save my friend. Still, when she came up to my cage with a piece of broccoli, I had to just squeak up. Release Aldo right away and you go back to where you came from. Gee, you're a feisty little thing, she said. That was a first. She was talking to me. You're so cute. I'd like to take you home with me. Boing! That was Og's reaction. My reaction was to quiver and shiver just thinking of being taken to the far-off planet of Spurling, home to the alien carrots. Boing, boing, boing! Og twanged. The creature giggled and then pushed the cart out of the room and turned out the lights. The room was dead silent for a few seconds, maybe a little longer. At last, I stopped twitching long enough to squeak. Og, she wants to capture us. Og splashed briskly. We can't let her do it. He splashed a whole lot more. I was relieved to be going home with Garth for the weekend, but my friend Og usually stayed in room 26 for the weekend since he could no longer... He could go longer without eating than I could. I would rest easily knowing Og might be going. I wouldn't rest easily knowing Og might be going to outer space while I was having a grand old time with Garth. Morning, Sue. Got something for me? Mr. Morales was all smiles when he came to room 26 on Friday morning. His tie had little kites with red tails trailing down. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot again. Mrs. Brisbane replied. The principal's smile quickly faded. Is there a problem, Sue? No, I just forgot. I'll bring it Monday, Mrs. Brisbane declared. Mr. Morales looked a little worried, and I didn't blame him. Mrs. Brisbane had never, never, never forgotten anything before. Goodness, if she could forget something important that Mr. Morales wanted, she could forget something else important, like helping my friends and me learn our vocabulary words. <laughs> I was worried about my teacher, and there was some more to worry about. Garth and AJ still weren't acting like old friends. In fact, Garth went to Great Lakes to avoid great lengths to avoid AJ, which wasn't easy because their desks were very close. At the end of the day, AJ tapped Garth on the shoulder. You taking Humphrey on the bus? He asked. No, my mom's picking us up. Garth replied. Can I have a ride? AJ was at least trying to be friendly. Nope, we have to stop somewhere on the way home. Garth turned his back on AJ and came over to my cage. I could tell his feelings were still hurt. He gathered up my cage, food, and even the new hamster ball. Well, he did. I had a last-minute message for Og. I wish you were going with me, Og. I hope you'll still be here when I get back, I squeaked. Boing, boing, he twanged at the top of his voice. I wondered if there were any frogs or hamsters on the planet Spurling, but I didn't want to find out in person. Farewell, froggy friend friend were my parting words. I'd had several adventures on the bus with AJ and Garth, but on that day, Garth's mother picked us up in a very tall car. Garth's brother, Andy, was in the back seat. Ham! Andy shouted. I didn't mind. He was little, and he didn't know the difference between a hamster and a ham yet. The ride home was smooth, nothing like the bumpy bus. Strangely enough, we didn't make a stop like Garth told AJ. Instead, we went straight home. Once I was settled on the family room table, I heard an odd twanging sound that reminded me a lot like Og. I could, could my friend have come along after all? Boing went the sound, then bling, bling. That didn't sound like Og at all. Garth came into the room carrying a large stringed instrument. He ran his fingers over the strings and out came the sounds. Bling, bling, bling. It sounded quite nice. How do you like my guitar, Garth asked. It's unsqueakably wonderful, I replied. I was just sorry all that came out was squeak, squeak, squeak. I've been taking lessons, Garth told me. Want to hear a song? Of course.
horse. He strummed those strings and played a great version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. I only heard two mistakes and they were pretty small. Bravo, I squeaked when he was finished. Did you like it, Garth asked. Here's one called Down in the Valley. He played it from start to finish without any mistakes at all that I could hear. Bravo, I shouted again. My classmates constantly surprise me with their talents. Tabitha and Seth know so much about sports. Saya sings beautifully and Art can draw. And ever since his birthday party where a magician performed, performed, Richie's been doing magic trip tricks. I could never forget how, figure out how he did them. Now Garth was playing the guitar. I only wish our other friends in room 26 could hear him. When his fingers got tired, Garth decided to clean out my cage. He was very surprised to find the hidden carrot and cauliflower. Hey, Humphrey, are you on a diet, he asked me. Be careful, I warmed him. They're from the planet Sparling. They may not be safe. Luckily, he threw them in the trash and examined my food bowl. It was empty, so he knew I'd been eating something. I guess you were just full, said Garth, but I'd better watch what you eat this weekend. I could guarantee him I was about to eat just about anything as long as it was from the planet Earth. That night, I was more awake than usual. Yes, I'm nocturnal, so I normally feel a little peppier at night than during the day. But what kept me awake that night was the thought of Og. I could almost picture him boarding the spaceship and taking off for Spurling. I hoped they understood frog language there. It's a beautiful day. We should all go outside, Garth's mom announced the next morning. She was right. The Tugwell's yard was a carpet of green grass and yellow and red flowers blooming around the sides. Tulips, Garth's mother called them. Garth put my cage on the patio. Garth's dad pushed Andy on a swing in the backyard while Garth's mom dug around in the dirt planting seeds. Come on, Humphrey, you need some exercise, Garth said as he gently took me out of my cage. Let's try out your hamster ball. I would have preferred to run freely in the grass, just like my wild ancestors once did, but at least I had the chance to roll on it. The grass looked even brighter and greener from inside the yellow plastic. Watch him go, Garth said. His mom, dad, and brother gathered around. The sound was a little muffled, but I could hear them laughing. It was harder to make the ball move on the grass than it had been on the slick floors of Longfellow School. The ground wasn't even, and once in a while, I'd hit a bump and veer off in an unexpected direction. But I didn't mind because it was fun to explore the yard on my own. Garth's mother went back to planting seeds, and his dad helped her. Want to roll, Andy insisted, so Garth showed Andy how to do a somersault. Then Garth helped Andy get his legs over his head and roll across the lawn. Roll, Ham, Andy called to me. Roll. So I rolled some more until I hit a wall. It wasn't a big hill, or until I hit a hill, it wasn't a big hill, but it was enough of a slope for my ball to pick up speed faster and faster and a little bit faster. It was fun, it was exciting. It was also scary, scary, scary. I stopped walking, but the ball kept rolling. I knew that cars slowed down when humans step on brakes. Unfortunately, hamster balls don't have brakes. So I tried to flatten myself out on my tummy, pushing down hard with my paws, hoping that would help slow down the ball. It didn't. The ball rolled and rolled and rolled some more until finally it came to a stop near some bushes at the back of the yard. Whew. My ball may have stopped, my head was still spinning. I was tired and a little thirsty, but at least I was safe inside the plastic. It was nice in the shade, dark, leafy, and quiet, a little too quiet. I could hear Garth and Andy laughing, but they sounded very far away, and they didn't sound like they were looking for me. I realized that if they didn't miss me, I'd never be able to roll back up the hill. I sat in the ball, catching my breath and hoping to come up with a plan. I was distracted, however, when a long, dark shadow fell over me. I looked up, and I was shocked to see two beady eyes a number of huge teeth and horrible long whiskers hovering directly over my head. Guys, what do you think it is? Let's see. It was, oh no, a cat. Guys, we finally found the cat that's on the cover of the book. Eek, I squeaked. The face moved in closer to the ball. A long pink tongue poked out from the sharp white 
teeth. I might have fainted, but I didn't dare risk it. I needed to stay calm and deal with this crisis, but eek! I squealed again. I didn't mean to. It just slipped out. A huge paw dropped down on the top of my ball. Boom! I fell flat on my back. Funny how I'd worried all night about Og safety, and here I was, the one in great danger. Well, that wasn't so funny after all. The cat leaned in closer and opened his mouth wider to show off his pointed teeth, just in case I missed them the first time. He took his paw off the top of the ball. Phew! Maybe he was losing interest. But no, the next thing he did was lie on the ground with the ball and me between his front paws. Then he began a charming little game. He batted the ball from one paw to the other, which made me feel like I was in a game. I saw at Kirk's house. Pinball, they called it. Bop, bop, bop. The ball spun from side to side, and I spun too. One second, I was upside down. Then I was right side up, and I also slid from side to side. This might have been the cat's idea of a fun game, but not mine, because I was pretty sure I wasn't going to be the winner. While I was being tossed around, I started wondering how easy it would be for the cat to open the ball and get at me. My cage, after all, has a lock that doesn't lock, but if this hamster ball had a catch that doesn't catch, the catch was I'd be caught. Sweetums, where are you? Sweetums, time for din din. I heard a voice calling in the distance. The cat's head certainly jerked, suddenly jerked to one side. So this must be Sweetums who was being called. While he was distracted, I hurled myself against one side of the ball, which then rolled down under the brush. This is the last page of chapter seven. Sweetums, mommy wants her baby girl to come home. Din din, the voice called out again. Oops, Sweetums was a girl, a downright mean one, too. Sweetums poked her head under the bush and batted at me with her paw. Luckily, the ball was wedged against a branch. Sweetums, the boy was more, voice was more insistent. Yummy din din. I guess Sweetums decided that din din in the dish was more of a sure thing than a hamster in a bush. And she trotted away, leaping over the fence and into the next yard. I was relieved, but I was also a little lonely and a little thirsty too. I suddenly thought that after Sweetums finished her dindin, she might come back to the Tugwell's yard for dessert, namely me. Speaking of the Tugwells, where were they? They seemed as far away as the planet Spurling. The definition at the end of this chapter is cat. Like dogs, cats are extremely dangerous creatures with sharp teeth, gleaming eyes, pointed claws, and an appetite for smaller, cuter, cuter animals such as hamsters. If a cat gets a hold of a hamster, it can lead to a catastrophe, which I don't even want to think about. Humphrey's Dictionary of Wonderful Words. All right, friends, we will read chapter 8 tomorrow on page 64. Have a great rest. Love you.